Hi, I'm Dan Slagan, CMO of Thrive Five, and welcome to episode three of Locals, where we're here in Somerville, Massachusetts, at the home of Remnant Brewing Company. Let's take a look. So you guys are in Bow Market here, uh, which for those that are not familiar with the local area, this is basically like an outdoor local mall of sorts. <laughs> There's 30 different businesses here, some are pop-up, some are, some are long-term, and all you guys work, all the businesses work together? Or? We, we definitely all, like, we all know each other. It's a small community. We all, like, we try to do some collaborations, like, for example, for, um, for the beer lo-fi that we have on, we're hosting, like, a lo-fi DJ night, so that one is a DJ. Um, with Union Sound, a music shop that's here in the market. So we try to think of things like how can we get one of these businesses to like highlight their product in our space. Um, and with Union Sound, they sell like beat making equipment and like teach classes and they have a teeny tiny little space. So it's kind of cool for them to be able to like spread out a little bit and reach more people than might even find their shop upstairs. Yeah. Um, so that's one example of a collaboration. We've um, had maca make ma maca macarons with our beers yeah, before. Those so. are always good. Yeah, nice. several times actually. Nice. And so as general manager, you've been here for a year. Uh, it's currently Monday at one o'clock, but in a couple hours and on the weekend, this place is going to be slammed. How have you thought about your marketing strategy? How have you gotten so many people to come here? You guys yeah. have built up a pretty trustworthy brand in a short amount of time. Um, <laughs> how have you guys done it? Yeah, well, a lot of that is like hand in hand with Bull Market. They throw awesome events. Um, for Porch Fest this year, 6,000 people came to Bull Market. And what's Porch Fest? Porch Fest is a Somerville wide music festival in which um, bands kind of like sign up to be on people's porches, and it's all around the town of Somerville. We hosted um, here in Bow Market. There was a, a stage over there, and we had like three bands throughout the afternoon. And Bow Market can get a special event liquor license so that people can grab a drink from any establishment and like hang out here, which is what they want to do all the time anyway. So you also have the, the, the city of Somerville working with you guys to help promote local business and actually help you guys grow. Yeah, definitely to some extent. Um, actually, the newest business coming, Nibble Kitchen, is part of the Somerville Arts Council. So that one will be um, really run by the city of Somerville. So they're going to have, you know, they're going to be here, like see what's going on. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're definitely supportive of the, like, the type of events and festivals that we have. Um, but that, so I guess to go back to your question, that's the best way that we get, like, new, you know, huge exposure is these festival days so we've yeah. thrown like a saint patrick's day festival um oyster fest was hosted by hooked which is a fish shop here um the next one coming up is for bastille day july 14th and then in august there will be a rebel revels which the wine bar is hosting so all of the businesses here have kind of like stepped up to to be like the leader on some sort of market-wide event and it really broadcasts to their audience and then gets their audience in our doors Um, so this is where we get started in the morning. We have a full coffee program up here at this bar and we start serving beer at 11 a.m. If you ever need that morning fix. Um, we have kind of like cafe seating and some barrels up in this space, which is just like a little bit of our production. And um, so you do so here. So you do both breakfast, you do coffee, bagels, snacks, pastries. Yeah, just pretty light pastries and coffee. Um, and then beer is up here as well. And have you, when you guys start selling coffee right when you opened, or is that new? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, um, coffee was kind of always the idea of this location and why we opened so early. Um, we do production during the day a lot, so being open in the day allows people to come in and see what's going on, and then they can get a coffee and like hang out here. And then also it's a great spot for everyone who works in the market to come in before they go to work. Nice. Yeah. 
Come on back. The brewery production area at Remnant is very small, square footage. It's packed in there. It's not a lot of extra space at all, but uh, as you see, people can come and hang out and work and, and chill and watch what's going on. Um, on most weekdays, we have a lot more going on than we do right now, but um, you know, as Britt mentioned, we also have oak barrels, um, several oak barrels. We've got a bunch of smaller ones here. Um, we have some large red wine and bourbon and whiskey barrels over in the uh, barrel room. And um, there's beer in every single one of these, and just this morning we were transferring beer out of one and a different beer back in. So, um, so how many barrels are you guys filling per week? Uh, well, these ones, we don't do work with the oak barrels every single week, I would say. Um, but um, like today, we did two of these 25-gallon barrels. So that's not very much as far as our total production goes of 50 gallons in, 50 gallons out. Um, uh, but you know, it varies. It's hard to say because sometimes we'll do a much bigger project where we have several big barrels kegged off. Um, no, then there'll be several weeks where we don't do anything with them. So a lot of the time is, is aging, letting the beer get to where it wants to be and, and tasting it periodically and figuring out what to do with it. Got it. So these are all 25 gallons in yep. here? And then what are these numbers here? You get 58, um, 54? Actually, we, we just uh, numbered these today based off a spreadsheet that we had that keeps track of everything that's in these. Uh, we, you know, since we started, some of these have changed. We've gotten rid of some, gotten some new ones. So we had to go back through and renumber everything. Um, Got yeah. it. And on average, how long usually does beer stay in, in a barrel? I mean, it obviously ranges months um, to a year. It's but totally dependent on a lot of things, but like um, this oat wine that we just kegged off today um, has been in there since February, which isn't that long, but it's because these barrels that we did today are uh, small first use whiskey barrels. Um, so they are, um, have a, a ton of character and um, you don't need that long, uh, especially in smaller barrels to get the character you want. However, a lot of other beers will leave in for much longer periods of time, even longer than a year sometimes. Um, and especially the sours that we have uh, in red wine barrels will let it go for a real long time. God, are there certain so. types of beers that you just want to age much longer? Yeah, generally high alcohol, um, the higher alcohol beers, uh, darker beers, sour beers are the types of beers you want to age for long periods of time. Almost anything else is a beer that you don't want to age at all, you know? So um, anything with hops as the for at the forefront, you got to drink as fresh as possible. Got it. Uh, you wouldn't want to age a, an IPA in a barrel unless you were going to dry hop it after the aging, you know, which I've heard of people doing. But uh, Try to take us through your, your studio. <laughs> all right, yeah. Um, like I said, it's, it's cozy. Um, not a lot of breweries have as little space to work with for our size for the amount of beer that we're making. As so you've been a brewmaster for a while. Before working here, how much larger was the space you were used to typically working in? I mean, different breweries are vastly different. I've, I worked at, um, Mystic has a huge space uh, with which to work. Um, and um, this is just the other end of the spectrum where it's very tiny, um, but it works, you know? How did you get all this stuff in here? <laughs> now that I'm looking <laughs> at your doors. It was extremely difficult. Uh, no, it, it was, uh, we didn't have this wall here when the tanks came in. Uh, but even so, it was a challenge um, to fit all this in here and with the rigging equipment still be able to move, move the tanks around. We, di we didn't have, it, it comes down to square inches. Uh, you know. and did, you dig, did you dig the floor down here? Me not personally, no. I, di I didn't myself dig this, but we did, yeah. We, went di we took it down a few feet because otherwise these tanks wouldn't have fit in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Funny. All right, so walk us through it. What do we got? All right, well, um, maybe we should start down this end, actually. All right, so back here you got the brew house. Um, hot liquor tank in the back. That just means um, a, a tank where you can heat up filtered water and brew with it. Um, so hot liquor tank, kettle where you boil, mash tun. Doing that in reverse order there, but you know you, you create the mash uh, from malt and water, uh, run it off into the kettle, boil it, add the hops. Um, and a uh, whole are bunch of... Are you controlling of, everything through this interface? Yeah, there's a touch here? screen up there. You can control pumps, not everything. I mean, there's a lot of manual moving hoses around and opening valves, closing valves. There's a lot of manual stuff, but there is a, a touch screen uh, controller for the, the pumps and the temperature set points on yeah. various tanks. 
um, including all the fermenters, have glycol jackets, uh, which can uh, cool down the beer or keep the beer at a certain temperature that you want it at during fermentation. So um, you can control everything from there on that. Um, and when you think about uh, where breweries are going in the future, is more of the setup here becoming sort of more digitized interface, or is um, it more going to stay a mix of both? I mean, larger breweries have been doing that stuff for a long time. Um, maybe for smaller breweries, um, I think maybe 10 years ago, this same type of system would not have had uh, a touchscreen um, controller. But it's pretty simple. It's not. It's nothing too uh, rocket sciencey. So. Okay. Um, I'd say yes in general, maybe stuff's moving a little bit that way, but um, it, there's still a lot of manual stuff. Got it. It's a, it's a manual job at this level. Got it, okay. And so how many tanks do you guys have back here? We have five fermenters, which are the conical shaped tanks. Okay, um, so these are fermenters? These are fermenters. Um, four here, and there's one in the back over there, and then um, there are... Sorry, so these are fermenters? Yep, yep. Okay. They're, Fermenters, five fermenters, um, five bright beer tanks, which is where the finished beer goes um, after it's done in the fermenter. Um, and we can actually serve directly from those bright beer tanks. Um, and does it matter what type of beer is going in each one? Um, not really, no. 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 So this one might have had an IPA and then a salad. Then you, yeah, you because it, I mean, it's all, yeah, they're stainless and. Um, we very, very thoroughly clean and sanitize everything, so it doesn't matter. How do you even approach matter. cleaning this? Um, there, there's a, um, a spray ball in the top of the tank, so you can hook up a, a hose. You can hook up a pump and hoses that will spray through an arm through the spray ball, and it impinges all over the tank at like high velocity with cleaning chemicals, and uh, does an effective job of cleaning it. And then you rinse it and sanitize it. Got it. So, so if you guys are brewing, uh, say, an, an IPA that's not going to go in any barrel or anything like that, how long yeah. does, the, does the process from start to finish take? Um, an IPA is usually about two weeks, a little bit less than two weeks sometimes. Okay. Um, from start to serving at the tap. Yeah. Most beers I make are around two weeks. Um, but then you get into, like, lagers. We have a lager going right now. That's going to be about a month. Um, and then and you can go even longer than that on lagers, too. But um, the barrel-aged stuff, like I was explaining before, can be, you know, two or three months to like a year plus, wow. depending on what type of thing it is. Wow, and where do you store, so you have all your, some ingredients so a lot here, of the malt, the rest? A lot of the malt is here. Uh, we also end up storing some of it in the tap room because uh, they, you know, we've, we've got a, a, a stack of Valley malt, which is local Massachusetts malt over in the barrel room there. We've got a couple stacks of this stuff over there as well, um, just because we don't have enough space down here always for all of it. So this is kind of our pride and joy and what really does set us apart from um, a lot of other bars and a lot of other breweries, but a place outdoors where you can drink. So it's great during the summertime. Um, it's great today. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm gonna actually crack one of these open because this is kind of fun. It's a joy to behold. Nice, yeah, so it's beautiful that it's 80 degrees out today. How, uh, how long will you keep the patio open? Honestly, I always say the patio is open every day if you want to be outside. Yeah. <laughs> so like even in the winter, you know, we had all the furniture stacked up and under tarps. But if it was like a suddenly nice day, people can come out here, sit on this bench and be outdoors. I mean, I'm not going to tell you not to go outside. And you put heat lamps out here and yeah, we, colder monster. Well, we have, we only have a couple of heat lamps um, and we were using them on the little bit of space we have up front yep. just because the, the awning there would actually keep, keep the heat better. Yep. Um, out here, it is kind of like whatever the weather's doing is what you get. <laughs> yep. And I think I have noticed here sometimes you guys run a bunch of events. I've seen you guys yeah. have uh, live DJs out here. Is that yeah, something you do um, often? Or? We've moved away from DJs a little bit okay. uh, out of respect for our neighbors. Okay. But we have had, like, we have an acoustic um, music series this summer. So Thursday nights we're going to have music. We have yoga on Saturday mornings. We have, like, some other fitness classes on Sunday mornings. You have yoga out here? Yeah. When? On um, Saturday mornings. How many breweries are doing yoga on Saturday <laughs> mornings? That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, a few. And some people will stay and, like, immediately dive in and get a beer. Yeah. Uh, some people just get their day started and, like, come sweat out the yoga and then like come back later in the day. Um, nice. But it's awesome because we're really getting people into the space that may not have known that we're here or may not know that we have like this much outdoor space. Because as you saw, you have to kind of like trek <laughs> to get here. Uh, so 
So you have the coffee shop, which is open early morning. Mm -hmm. What time do things usually get going around here? It's pretty dependent day to day. Weekdays, we don't really see like a crowd until 5.30 or 6. Um, we try to keep some sort of event going on. So any day of the week, like tonight we have trivia. We have a running club that usually comes uh, one Tuesday a month. We have a couple like kind of happy hour meetups that happen on Wednesdays. We've done like poetry readings. So we try to have stuff that get people in the door. Um, but that's all like after work crowd. Yeah. On the weekends, we do get a pretty big um, like Saturday morning coffee activity yeah. rush. And then beer will really pick up around like 3 or 4 p.m. Yeah. yeah. So events is a huge part of your business is how you get people to come here. For those that are not from the great state of Massachusetts, we do not have a happy hour. Uh, <laughs> so how do you guys deal with that? How do you think about getting people in here early yeah. and, and, and all that? Um, yeah. Good question. Uh, so the, the biggest focus is that is that like early week when you know normal folks are out on the weekend meeting up with their friends, drinking. So we really do try to program our early week so there's just something going on. Um, we've worked with a bunch of different community groups that like the the storytelling organization they hosted a few different breweries throughout the neighborhood, and so that's just like a cool thing. It gets. It gets people together for something other than just beer, which is also important. Um, the networking groups, uh, we have a queer and feminist happy hour, so that's really like important to me, um, to get women out drinking beer and meeting each other and chatting. Um, and that was a group that reached out to us and said, hey, would you be cool if we had a meetup? And like the first couple meetups were 15 or 20 people, and now they have like 60 people usually show up. Oh wow! Yeah. And so, so will you use this backspace to host them and everything? They kind of hang out wherever they want. They'll, uh, if the weather's poor, they'll hang out in here. Um, in the winter, you know, they were in here, yeah. and then they'll spill out a little bit if the weather's nice. Oh, yeah. Um, the nice weather in general helps though with like uh, yeah. late afternoons, even on a weekday. Sometimes yeah. there'll be a crowd out here if it's really nice, and people will just chill and show up and chill on the patio. You know. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, we're starting to be a little bit more of like an after work destination when you realize like 10 or 15 friends are all coming together. Yep. Uh, you know, just to hash about their day. So it's it's awesome that we have like this space, which really is pretty unique in this neighborhood. Yeah, and one of the clubs I heard you guys have is you have a pregnant women's club. <laughs> yeah. There's I've never sort of like heard of a, I've never heard of a pregnant women's club at a brewery. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Like and and also it's like new moms, some of which who happen to also be pregnant. Okay. Again, uh, again or still. How did that even get started? Yeah, they just show up, so it's that one's like pretty unofficial too. Um, there's a, there's a couple of inquiries I've gotten that's just like, hey, we're a moms group and we want to come hang out on a Friday at noon, and I'm like, cool. Come on down, like the space is yours. Yeah. And then a few times it's just been like six or seven moms will roll up with their strollers and, and the kids are teeny tiny and you know, they'll get a latte or they'll get a beer and they'll be like, this is my first beer. Do you feel like you guys have obviously put a lot of work and attention into the atmosphere and the experience? Do you feel like that's why people are reaching out to you and, and asking you to use your space? I mean, not a lot of breweries have this type of space. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I like to think so, uh, but half of them are like, I've never been there before. Can we come by? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, the answer is always yes. Well, hopefully the quality of the coffee and the quality of the beer has a lot to do yeah. with it as well. Yeah. 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 And are you writing both the descriptions and the names? Uh, we, we collaborate on the descriptions and the names. Um, Mostly, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get a couple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, actually, I wrote that description for Creative Era, so I will take credit for that one. There you go. <laughs> so what do we have on tap? Um, if someone were to walk up, you know, you're in off the street, you've never been here, we would probably say, why don't you taste the Bow Street or taste the Dream Pop? That is, like, pretty much a beer that's going to set. They're both beers that are going to satisfy almost anyone. Um, a lot of people who step up to the bar have some notion of what they like or what they don't like. Uh, part of the fun of being a bartender is trying to, like, break that down. If you walk in and you're like, I hate hops. Okay, cool. I'm still going to pour you a taste of the Dream Pop because it's such a well-balanced hoppy beer, so it has a really awesome mouthfeel. Mouth mm. um, brewed with oats to give it like a little bit of a richness and a silkiness. We use a ton of dry hops in it, so it has an amazing aroma, but it doesn't really have much bitterness. Yeah. So that's a hoppy beer that wins over 
non-hoppy beer people. So break down the people that come in. What percentage of people are coming in saying, I want an IPA versus I want a sour versus my boyfriend or girlfriend dragged me here, I don't like beer. Yeah, like yeah, what were sure. the... Um, well, so IPAs are pretty hot right now, uh, but they've been hot for a while. So there's definitely like a good 50% of people who walk in, don't even look at the menu and they're just like, what, do you have an IPA? Is there an IPA? I can only drink IPA, you know. I'm like, oh yeah, for sure, you know, we, we usually have between one and three. This past weekend we actually had four IPAs on, but then we kicked one, so back down to three. Um, so that's an easy place to start. And then again, like people who walk in and say, what's your least toppy beer? So we usually have some sort of Saison, Sour, or Bow Street session. And again, Bow Street has hops, but it's not like a real punch in your face. And then for people who are just like, I don't like beer at all, it's kind of fun to say, well, what do you usually drink? Whiskey, wine, you know, gin, and then turning people on to sour beer is, that's usually a really good place to start for people who don't like beer, because sours mm. have that like juiciness, and it's not quite as malty, and it's just like, you know, really a different direction. So yeah, most people are into, well, most people who don't like beer tend to like sours. Yeah, one thing yeah. we were talking about though is like, if you have an IPA that you don't love, you can still drink it and you probably think it's fine. Right. With a sour, it's kind of a hit or miss. You're like, oh, I really don't like that. Yeah, yeah, like, I think we've been, I've served a lot of people who say, I don't like sours, and I'm like, well, just give it a try. And they like our sours, so yeah. Charlie can take all the credit for that. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so Charlie, when you guys are serving these beers, you know, I think as, as craft beers come, come on the rise in the last 10 years, it's becoming almost more like a wine. Right. Um, you're not supposed to drink as much. You're supposed to savor the taste and the aromas. Like, how do you describe to people or suggest to people they go about what they should notice or what they should try and taste when they're, when they're having beer? So for instance, this is the Criadera. So yeah. I, can, I can read the description right. and then... So, so in this, I mean, it's a, it's a complex barrel-aged sour, so you're looking for a little bit of... Uh, you, you get a lot of interesting fruit notes in the aroma, uh, but you also get some funk, uh, pleasant funkiness in the aroma. Like an earthiness kind of, um, a nuttiness almost. And um, that's the aroma. It's big. There's a lot going on. Um, but then when you taste it, um, it's not super full-bodied, and this particular beer is uh, actually less sour than um, like the Space Junk, which is a, a kettle sour that we have on right now. It's less sour than a lot of the sours that people are used to these days. Um, so it's, it's, it's still very smooth, um, in, and it's not too full-bodied, like I said, and then it finishes with a pleasant sourness and, and a, little bit of the, uh, a little bit of that same funkiness on the finish. Nice. So, all right. Give it a shot. Let's give it a whirl. Yeah. That's really good. Thanks. That's how many how many like batches did you try before you came up with that exact blend? Uh, well, so this is kind of a work in progress. I mean, we uh, the initial because of the nature of what this beer is as a barrel aged uh, barrel fermented sour, the initial beer that we put in there is almost less important uh, than the microflora that's in the barrel. And the, what happens during the aging process. And yeah. sort of what it, it sort of turns into something. Like I had a fairly good idea of what this was going to do over time, but I didn't know exactly. So it's part of the fun of it. Yeah. Um, nice. How many of the beers do you save for yourself, for like your private collection? Uh, well, I mean, there's no, there's no beer that I've uh, saved the entire thing. I can't drink that much. but. Uh, uh, you know, like, and, and I don't, and people ask me what my favorite beer on tap is, and I have a hard time answering, honestly, I really do. Um, I try to vary it, um, when I, when I taste something, um, it, I try to change it up so that, A, so that I know what, how everything's tasting, but I actually like all the beers that we're making, so, um, otherwise I wouldn't be making them, so, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It's a tough question to answer, I guess. Um, yeah, that's awesome to see. Um, so you guys obviously also have a whole non-alcoholic section here. What else are you guys serving? Brittany, again, multitasking. Yeah, Impressed? Yeah. <laughs> we have um, we have iced tea that we make, coffee, all sorts of coffee drinks. And then we work with um, Aqua Vitae to serve kombucha. And that is, uh, people love it because it's like fizzy and kind of sweet and it's like a soda. And it's a great way to look like you're drinking beer. So if you want to like blend in with your friends, 
Nice. Um, yeah, we serve kombucha in, you know, in class as well.